Hi, my name is Lena James and I am an associate professor at Christ University, Bangalore. Today we will be discussing about the new challenge in India, the digital India. We know that the new government has committed itself to extend the internet facility, e-government service, education and telemedicine to all the communities of our country. The technology is one thing, but how do we prepare to better use of these wonderful new capabilities? Could it be that we need to enhance and upgrade our educational offerings so people feel more excited and energized? Dr. Charles M. Savage, an expert in teaching methodologies, who has come all the way from Germany, is with us today. He is the president and mentor Knowledge Era Enterprising International and helps the companies and educational institutions across the globe to discover the tremendous human potential, the fast emerging digital economy. He has just spent a couple of weeks with our MBA students at Christ University. He engaged the students in discovering themselves via online research, what the factors are, what they mean and how they are interconnected. They capture their thoughts, questions and impressions using infographics and discovery mapping. Yes, Dr. Charles is here with us today to share his views on visual digital literacy and infographics and their effective usage, the teaching learning process of higher education system in India. To start with, Dr. Charles, could you tell us what is the significance of this particular program and what is the background behind it? Be glad to do that. Thank you very much, Dr. Lena. Something very special is happening in India today. I've been coming to India since 1992 and I can see that there is a new spirit uh, here, especially with the new government and its commitment to digital India. What does that mean for our educational institutions? What does that mean for our companies? Our companies are going through a profound change thanks to big data, the internet of everything, the cloud, 3D printing, cyber currency, and so much more. How does that echo in the classroom? What's happened, it seems, is that for a long while, India settled into a teaching style, which is what they here call mugging up. And that means that the students are asked to read a book, listen to the lecture of the professor, and then in the exam, repeat back what they learned. I would call this using their shallow memory what I see happening in the emerging digital India is that we need to make the shift to a model of deep learning where yes, they learn how to do things, they learn what things are, but they need to bring another ability that they already have and that, but they need to bring another ability patterns of what's emerging among and between many different factors. And as they do that, they are gaining new insights. So if you shift or think about an educational system that goes from teaching facts to inviting the students to find insights, it really changes the dynamics of the classroom. Yet this is in profoundly necessary because historically, we have grown up with Adam Smith's pin making factory where we divide work up into little steps and one person does this, another person does this, the third person does this. And they qualify for this with their certificate. They become a supervisor, a manager, an executive, and a president. And they build what they do based on a lot of past experience. But when you shift to the world of big data, where you have both structured data, which is perhaps 20% of what's available, and real-time data from Facebook, from Twitter, from sensors in the city picking up traffic, from 
Uh, the way people use their, their smartphones indicates that perhaps there's some kind of sickness developing in a community. We can start to see things in different ways, but we need people that can work together collaboratively, not competitively, listen to one another, ask questions, and look for the patterns. Unfortunately, in our educational system, we ask the students thousands of questions, but we never teach them how to ask good questions. And perhaps if, and I know Christ University and many other universities are reaching for a level of excellence, uh, that means that as they are in tune with these profound developments, they will create a learning environment where the students come alive, where they're excited, where they feel that they're engaged as individuals. And this will change and energize India and its future in ways that we couldn't imagine. In these past two weeks with my 32 students, I saw an amazing ability. I didn't train them in the use of the technology, infographics, or uh, discovery mapping. I simply asked them and they were able to exceed my expectations. So I already have seen real excellence here in uh, Christ University, and I travel around to other universities, and I'm beginning to see that as well. So we have a big challenge. How can we move beyond mugging up to a classroom setting where the professor becomes both a giver of knowledge and a learner together with his or her students. Is that possible? Okay, right. Okay, one question from my side. Yes. How are the students involved in this process in your classroom delivery? Very good. Uh, what I ask them is, I say, let us go from the individualistic, competitive model that we've had, and let us learn to listen to one another, value one another, appreciate one another. And let's eliminate the traditional stress. So I said, in my class, we won't feature competition. Yes, it's there, it will always be there, but let us try another mode. Secondly, I said, please ask one another thoughts because we all have little ideas, we, we, we express them. And the other person usually comes back with, but, and we feel bad about that. And I realize that there are some words in our language that are very toxic. And when we think either or, it's either my thoughts or your thoughts, we usually use the but to put down the other person. So I said, please eliminate buts and use and, both and. You have an idea, I have an idea. Let's grow it together. So they started growing their ideas. They read about topics that they had no idea before the class. I didn't explain them. They, they used their computers, they did research, they took a topic, and they put the topic name in an in infographic. Amazing what you can get in no time. They put the topic in, and then they put file type colon PPT to find PowerPoints on that. They used SlideShare, Wikipedia. They educated themselves so quickly and so well that they were excited, and they shared it, and then they looked for models, and they discussed it and reflected. And so what happened was we were growing insights in real time, okay. and it was exciting. Okay. From the student's perspective, what are the difficulties they faced in this process? What was amazing is that it was so easy. And what I have seen is that, if I may talk historically, when the British were talking about their educational philosophy in the early 1800s. Earlier, the East India Company had supported uh, scholarship in Sanskrit, Persian, and Arabic. But then they said, and the name that's usually uh, connected with that is uh, Thomas Macaulay, let us teach them English because they're not making it with their own culture or language. And you created then an educational model that separated the people from the culture. When you allow that culture, their natural curiosity, the wisdom that you have in the various cultures here in India, the Christian community, the Hindu community, 
the Muslim community, Jains, Buddhists, uh, Farsis, you have wonderful resources. And so I ask my students, I don't want you just to be smart about these things. I'd like you to start to be wiser. So simply, I created a collaborative environment. I asked them to listen deeply, ask questions, and think about the meaning of what this is. And they did it with no problem at all. That's what gives me hope. Okay. Why the new approach all about? What about this new approach? What it is, is to see that each person is a wonderful gift to us all. And when each person has an idea, it complements what we're thinking. It's not no longer what's right thought. It is what does it mean? And it's not just to fit in and do what's right. I was also saying our challenge is to learn to co-create the future in a wiser way. Now, most people don't use the word co-create. We don't know how to do it. And yet, that's the opportunity. So Digital India allows us to bring into our schools a different teaching style where we're not just teaching them the way things are, because that's changing profoundly. We're preparing them to participate in their lives, in companies, in government, in NGOs, in teaching, a whole new way. But it's so natural to the Indians that I know. So it won't be hard if we just get out of the way and let it happen. Okay. From the faculty perspective, how the faculty can use it effectively and efficiently to enhance their classroom delivery? Very good. I think if the faculty sees that they are not over against the students, they can't trust the students, they have to watch and monitor the students, which we often do. But if I take a step back, a friend of mine in Vienna had a sculptor create two columns, one three meters high, one circular, chrome and very shiny, the other very rough and uneven. This is what we know, this is what we don't know. When I asked the students, do we know about as much as we don't know? They kind of wonder about that. Do we know most things and there's just a little bit more that we don't know? No. Is it that there's a little bit we know and there's a lot that we don't know? And they usually pick that. So that suggests, what if, our, what if we as uh, teaching uh, professionals said, this is what I know, but this is what I don't know. Could you help me understand it? And what I find when I do that is there's a profound shift with the students. They're open, they're lively, and even though I was teaching from nine to five, at five they were still energized. They weren't anxious to go, they were still discussing and reflecting. So it really is not only telling, but also asking. Okay. Uh, Dr. Charles, could you tell me what is the difference of mind mapping and infographics? Surely. What I try to do is to give them a framework to see the patterns. And many people know the wonderful technology of mind mapping where you take a theme and you look and see what it's, what's related to it. I have chosen to use infographics and there's some soft, wonderful software packages where you can take ideas, graphics, and themes and put them together in a very simple way. But doing that, it challenges you to find the essential relationships. Discovery mapping is what I have done as an extension of what we know as the World Cafe, something that I developed the prototype for in 1990 while I was working with Digital Equipment Corporation. The idea of having people sit in teams of four and often the standard model is that you discuss the same topic. What I do is I ask people to take different topics. They develop a uh, 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 discovery map where they have the topic. They say, who's working on it? What are the powerful questions we have to ask about that? What is it that we don't know about that? Where are the tipping points? And where is the wisdom that we can draw on to better understand this. And so the whole approach with infographics and discovery mapping is to discover the patterns and the interrelationships. 
And after they develop these uh, discovery maps, we have a session where each has a different discovery map at a table, and the students move between the tables and they look for the connections between their discovery map and four or five other discovery maps. And we capture this on a big uh, wall board with brown paper to see the interrelationships. Typically, mind mapping doesn't give you, a, it shows a lot of relations about just one topic. But when you show almost on a random that there are many other topics, it's amazing. And this Saturday, uh, we had uh, outside people from industry, education, alumni from the program, and everybody had such a wonderful learning time. They felt enriched by it. Okay, sir. As a teacher, how do you use it for your classroom lectures? Even though you have mentioned something on that, could you please explain a little bit on that part? Yes. The, perhaps the trouble is that you are challenged here because you have a set curriculum. And you have to cover the book. And so there's that dilemma, how do you do that? If you could take the themes from the book and ask the students to find it out themselves and put it together, oftentimes they will have more current information because some of our books are a bit old at times. Uh, some of our PowerPoints might also be that way. So this has a very fresh approach. You can still take the material that you have to cover, but you do it through asking and giving them the space to put it together. What they could do in such a short period of time was totally amazing. Uh, to the last question, how do you create digital literacy among the faculty and the students? Wonderful question. Christ University has committed itself to build and develop a big data analytics laboratory thanks to the support of IBM. And I sat in on the opening session of that two days ago. And here the faculty is being asked to not only think about its own little area of expertise, but to say, how does this big data that's coming through the internet of things and stored in the cloud, where are the patterns there? So if I'm in finance, I have to then take data. It's not just the old techniques of drawing up a balance sheet or monitoring sales, but uh, how do you price things that we haven't priced before? How do you price the cost of carbon in my products or services? Uh, when I'm in logistics, how do I look at the cost of logistics from these perspectives as well? So what we're doing is we're going to a model that includes people, planet, and uh, profit. profit. It's not just profit. We're also developing new organizational models like conscious capitalism, the sharing economy, the circular economy, the B Corporation. The students need to be ready to, to participate in these, not just fit in the old little box in some organization. So what I see with the digital India is a wonderful opportunity to rethink our organizations rethink our education, reconnect with the wisdom of India, and awaken and liberate the individuals in ways. They're so much under pressure just to get out, get a job, and make money. Yet I see here in, uh, uh, excuse me for the old word, uh, Bangalore or uh, uh, Begaluru, that they are starting to think about reintroducing Sanskrit in the educational. Fantastic what's happening. So how do you go from teaching that is telling to asking? How do we go from mugging up, which is using the shallow memory, to deep learning? How do we go from focusing on facts to looking for insights? How do we take the objective world that I can see, feel, and touch, and measure, and bring it together with the subjective world that has values and vision and memory, and how can we in our educational experience and work experience bring together the whole person? It's perfect for India, and by 2100, India will be the largest nation in the world, followed by India and surprisingly, probably Nigeria. 
we don't think about this. But to have a vibrant economy when everything is digitalized, we're going to have to go beyond the digital economy and create a co-creative cultural economy. And we're not even starting to think about that. But we can build it into the way we teach, the way we work, and the way we talk with one another. Thank you, Dr. Charles. It was a wonderful and inspiring session. I'm sure this will definitely help the teachers and the students to improve their digital literacy and energize India. Thank you for being with us. Thank you very much. Thank you.